Well, folks, it's got to mean something. When you're minding your own business on Facebook, and it's a Wednesday afternoon or evening, depending on how you look at it. It's 7 o'clock p.m., and you see the album cover just sort of hovering there on your screen, and you hear the disembodied voice in the background going on and on and on and on and on. If you've been here before, then you're like Rocky Erickson, where I have always been here before. And I, Malcolm Tent, am definitely prone to being here now live, whether it's before or after or during, for your favorite cable TV show and mine, Tent Talks Tunes. Welcome aboard, everybody. What do you say we all get together and flex some fanboy and fangirl music muscle? I'll take care of the dude contingent right here from my beautiful home in Danbury, Connecticut. I'm surrounded by music and noise and art. You can't see it all, but it's here. It infuses me. It infects me. It reflects on my inflection. It's all happening, baby. It's the fuel that drives. Tent Talks Tunes. Whew! So much to talk about. I was uh, not here last week because I was just shaking off a little bit of a cold. Here we go. <clears throat> that famous on-camera cough of mine, shaking off a little bit of a cold that I picked up in the Tar Heel State a couple of weeks ago. I don't know what it is, but the last uh, three out of four visits that I partook down there, I picked up a bug. So the coughing and the sniffling and the sneezing and the wheezing and the rubbing of the eyes, I had it, and I was like, more over it than not last week, but I just did not feel like going on camera and being chipper and happy and bright. It wasn't in me. Didn't have it. So I skipped it out, took a nap instead, felt a lot better. Thank you very much. Speaking of feeling a lot better, if you people have been following the saga of this, check it out. My hot pink cast is gone replaced by a, a by a hot black wrist brace. Oh yes, it's got a knob on it. You can tighten it. You can loosen it. I can even take it off occasionally and that my friends is a real good thing. A real good thing. Um, I am just almost a little more than halfway done with a 12 week healing arc on this thing. After the surgery that I had to repair a broken wrist, I broke it when I was 19, got it fixed when I was 57. What can I tell you? When you're as young as I was and as dumb as I was, doing things like trying to scale the side of a building on the outside seemed like a good idea. It really honestly seemed like a good idea. I swear it seemed like a great idea at the time. <coughs> and then the fact that it didn't hurt enough to affect my guitar playing or my, you know, my daily life, well, that was adequate. Those are the kinds of decisions you make when you're that age. And then finally you hit the age of 57 and the pain just gets to be more than you can bear and you got to get it fixed. And that's what I finally did a little more than six weeks ago. They sliced me open, they took out all the broken bones, fused some of those that were left, and I've been sealing and healing ever since. And, um... The prognosis looks very good, so I want to thank everybody who's inquired about that. Um, sorry, I haven't been posting updates more frequently, but I got there's a lot of stuff going on. I haven't really been thinking about this thing so much. Um, but there you go, an update. I should and look at this. I can cross my fingers there too. I should be getting this thing off in about five weeks, and the doctors said that uh, the plan was to take it off and just let me go nuts. So, very excited about that. I will drink a big draft of Danbury Tap to that, my friends. A healthy prognosis. Mm-mm. That's showing him good. Let's take a look at the monitor here and see if people are tuned in and if they're digging the talking and the tunage. As always, it won't show me exactly who's tuned in. I just want to make sure that people are indeed tuned in. 
Yes, indeed. I see that uh, my bandmate Walt Wheat from Hattiesburg, Mississippi is tuned in. James from the great state of Connecticut is there. Uh, Ms. Gelman is flexing in Tucson, Arizona. Mike in Vancouver, B.C. And a whole bunch of others. I don't know who you are, but thanks for tuning in. <coughs> now, the first thing you guys saw when I uh, went on air was this New York Dolls album cover. And I was showing this for a reason. I recently got an inquiry from a friend of mine who is writing a, an article for... Uh, who I never thought I would say this in the year 2022. He's writing an article for Cream magazine. I guess Cream has been rebooted. And this dude is writing an article. He asked me if I had any idea, if I had any clues whatsoever as to who designed the New York Dolls logo. And I had to admit that I drew a blank. I have no idea. And he also made a lot of inquiries, including David Johansson himself. Uh, David Johansson gave a very non-committal answer to the question. Um, and this guy's like talked to the, uh, the company that actually printed the jackets and all kinds of folks and has not been able to come up with the answer. Who designed the logo for the New York Dolls? If anybody knows, please let me know post a comment or message me directly so I can forward the information to this dude so he can write his article. My guess, and you know I am Malcolm Tent and I'm always talking tunes, my guess is that uh, some unknown artist at the Mercury Records graphics department came up with it. And, you know, probably just did it uh, on salary as part of a week's work, you know, bashing out logos and graphics for all kinds of bands. That You know, whoever it was probably designed a logo for Tom T. Hall or for Rush. So no credit. They just earned their paycheck, but they designed a timeless, iconic band logo. And nobody knows who it is. We're pretty sure that it's not Christian Hoffman. One thing that my friend, and I'm sorry I am blinking out on your name, dude. Uh... My friend uh, learned that Christian Hoffman from the great New York City new wave band The Mumps drew that. He drew that rather scandalous, risque pencil sketch on the inside. Christian Hoffman, associate of Klaus Nomi, a great songwriter, uh, but apparently he did not do the logo. He can only take credit for the, the pencil sketch, but not the logo. Bit of a mystery, guys. So if anybody knows, please uh, help a brother out. Help a couple of brothers out. We need, all, we need all the help we can get. We need all the help we can get. And I'm still wondering, too, I put out a bit of an APB on this before. Does anybody out there know what an authentic Johnny Thunders autograph looks like? I mean, I have no reason to doubt that that's a real Johnny Thunders autograph, but I don't know for sure. So if anybody has any clues on that, and you want to help a brother out in that department, let me know. I'm exceedingly curious about it. I got a bunch of records like that that I don't know if they're really autographed or not. I've got a Frank Zappa record that has, you know, a Frank Zappa signature on it. Is it real? I don't know. I got a Lou Reed record like that. A couple other things here and there. No real way to authenticate them. One of the myriad agonies and pains of being a full time professional record dealer like myself. Let's have a toast to the pain and the agony and the misery of being a full-time professional record dealer. I'm a complete masochist, baby, because I love that pain. As Kiss would say, that is sweet, sweet pain. Go to my website, MalcolmTent.net. It's the clearinghouse for all things me, <coughs> including links to my Discog store, my eBay store, my Bandcamp. It's got a list of every single gig I've ever played in my entire life. It's got stories from my experiences on the road, photos, all kinds of great stuff. MalcolmTent.net. You don't want to miss it. Speaking of gigs, let's check the bulletin board, shall we? we got a few things coming up. <laughs> Excuse me, trying to go in order. This one's got me very excited. Devotional 2022, the annual Devo fan gathering, is taking place at the Beachland Ballroom in Clevo, Ohio, September 16th 
and September 17th. I'm pretty sure there are still tickets on sale, although uh, ticket sales have been extremely robust this year because uh, for the first time ever, not only do we have co-founding member of Devo, Jerry Casali, not only do we have Devo drummer, David Kendrick, not only do we have from Wall of Voodoo, Steve Bartek, or is it Bartok? I don't know, but that guy Steve from Wall of Voodoo is going to be there. Mark Mothersbaugh is <coughs> excuse me, I couldn't even say it without choking up. Mark Mothersbaugh is going to be there. Man, I sound great tonight, don't I? And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to be there playing a set on Friday night the 16th. Yes, I am doing a solo set of, hope you can take this, hope you're ready for this, not just songs, not just Devo songs, but a specially selected, hand-curated set of the most hated, unpopular, reviled, despised Devo songs ever. The Devo songs that make people want to cringe. The Devo songs that make people want to puke. The Devo songs that make people get violent if they're inclined towards that. And I certainly hope none of you are on the 16th and 17th. We try to keep it civil, even though de-evolution is real. These are the songs that push the buttons of Devo fans everywhere. And I am doing a full set of these extremely unpopular Devo songs. So, it might sound like something that you want to miss, but I guarantee you, you don't want to miss it. Because I've, I've been routining it, I've been rehearsing it, and I think it sounds pretty good. I, I'm going to have a lot of fun delivering this. So, Devotional, Cleveland, September 16th and 17th. Look it up on the internet, you'll find it. Right? Right. Um, in other chronological events, check it out. October 12th. October 12th. My next full-length tour kicks off in Bethel, Connecticut at Molten Java. It's me and my good pal Tim Holhouse. Tim, who's coming all the way from England, is going to play for you. He's going to play for me. It's a special early show at Molten Java, an after-school special, if you will, a Malcolm Tent Tim Holhouse after-school special. It runs from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m., all ages, no door charge, although we are taking donations for Tim to help him get from one des destination to the other. <coughs> After Molten Java, we're playing at Bell Tower Records in Adams, Massachusetts. We're playing at Willimantic Records in Willimantic, Connecticut, and many other, many other points in between. If you go to my website, malcolmtent.net, you will see the entire itinerary. Looking forward to November 5th. A weekend to look forward to, a weekend to live for. The anti-scene Ultra lineup makes its debut. On the 4th, we're playing at Reggie's in Wilmington, North Carolina. Sorry, on the 3rd, the 3rd, that's the 3rd, we're playing at Reggie's in Wilmington, North Carolina. On the 4th, is it Jacksonville? Jeff Clayton, if you're watching, Jeff, my boss in anti-scene, if you're watching right now, please help your bass player out. His brain is going... <laughs> rather than remembering the date. Walt! Walt, my bandmate. Where's the gig on the 4th? Tell me. Post something. Leave a comment. We know the 3rd is in Wilmington, and we know the 5th is Scumstock in Tampa, Florida. It's going to be us and Without MF Order and The Village of Weedville and A Killing Tradition and a whole bunch of others. So the third, the fourth, and the fifth, Anti-Scene, the brand new Ultra lineup, plays a solid weekend of pure, tightly controlled mayhem for you. Simultaneous to that, November 5th in Danbury, the Danbury Record and CD Expo. I co-promote it. The irony is, I'm going to be in Tampa that night rocking out. But the Danbury Record and CD Expo is on. We're signing up dealers right now. We have already quite a few who have never done the Expo before. So, dang, I regret missing that. But, you know, when you got to rock and roll, you got to rock and roll. You guys 
if you're in Danbury or anywhere near, can go to the Danbury Record Show and snap up all the good stuff that I would have been buying. That is my gift to you. I'm giving you a golden opportunity to find awesome records. All right, let's take a quick spin through the mailbox. It's been a very good mail week, and I'm not going to dwell too much on this because I, I do want to talk tunes, but the mail is so much fun. My good pal Dwayne from, uh, oh, this actually came, uh, nope, never mind. My good pal Dwayne in Australia sent me some patches, genuine, honest-to-God embroidered patches for his thing. And he explained to me he's got patches for the ladies, love from Dwayne, and he's got patches for the dudes, premium rock and roll, 101 octane. So everybody who follows Dwayne gets a patch just for them. Dwayne, thank you very much for these. I'll be sporting them proudly, and I'm going to send you something cool in return. Speaking of sending something cool in return, I have to stand up for this very quickly. Speaking of Australia, my good pal TG in Australia sent me all these CDs a while ago. I have not forgotten you, sir. I've got some stuff to send to you. It's been taking me a while to figure out what I was going to send to you. I finally doped it out. So I'll be getting that together very, very soon. Uh, let's see what other kind of awesome stuff did we get. My pal Brian Russell sent me his new album entitled Angel Devil. Why am I excited about it? Whoops. <laughs> Physical media. Because track number two is a song called Outsider that I wrote. Hey, Brian covered one of my songs. Haven't heard it yet, but you bet your sweet bippy I'm going to be playing it very soon. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that greatly, man. CD and cassette. Very exciting. You know I'm going to be playing that, baby. It's good for my ego. Ego, ego, ego. <laughs> all right, let's get all this mail cleared aside here. So much mail. So much mail. By the way, here's the address. P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. If you want to do some mail trading with me, send me some stuff. I will send some stuff back to you. All right. Ah, oh, boy, so much other mail, but you know what? I'm going to save some of this other mail for next week. I've got the big one right here, and this is the big one. This is literally the big one. Figuratively as well, it's got very specific instructions on air open and usually i'm a little bit leery about um, opening sealed packages cold on the air but i think in this case when it comes from la dama dorada y marido sin nombre i can probably trust the contents and uh, if you couldn't see the address before that's the address look at that that's a dang address man that's calligraphy. That is legible. That is my address. P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. Okay. On air open. It is sealed. I've actually had this for almost a week, but as per instructions, I've been waiting to open it on air. So here we go. <coughs> this is not a setup. This is not fakery. This is for real. Opening it up. Woo! This is fun. I like this. <laughs> oh, look at that. Look at that color coordination. We went from pink to orange. Oh, okay, we got instructions here. Keep going. I wasn't going to stop. Trust me, I was not going to stop. Oh, look at this. Ha ha ha. This is good. This is good. I love the suspense. I love the artistic temperament that La Dama Dorada is exhibiting here. She's such a tease. We're getting warmer. She's a tease, but I think the contents of this box are going to please. Huh? Wait a minute. Look at that. Look at all these great color combinations. This is fun. Oh, my God. I was just about to pass out from all the exertion, but... Finally, as pink has turned to orange and orange has turned to yellow and yellow has turned to blue, we are finally there. <sighs> I better take a drink. 
of Danbury Tap. Well, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't ruin the surprise. Maybe I should just stop now and open it up all the way next week. What do you guys think? Should I go all the way? Should I open the whole thing right now, or should I wait? Let's see if we can get a little bit of voting here. Who thinks that I should wait to open this, or who thinks I should open it right now? I want to see some responses here on the monitor. My trusty, dusty monitor. I got a thumbs up, but I don't know what the thumbs up is for. To wait or to just do it now. To take the advice of my own lyric and do it now. I want to see a shower of thumbs Thumbs up, says open it now. Thumbs down, says wait. Thumbs up, open it now. Thumbs down, says wait. If you guys are watching this archived on YouTube later, maybe you're not feeling the suspense. Maybe you're not feeling the actual tension in the air, but <coughs> I can assure you that it's happening live right now. It is very exciting. and very, Oh, look at that. Everybody wants to see it now. Everybody wants to see it now. Except, of course, my bandmate Walt Wheat, who says that I should wait and always leave them wanting more. Nick Sampson says that waiting has never done anybody any good. I am seeing nothing but thumbs ups. Not a single thumbs down. A couple of, just one from my contrarian pal, Walt Wheat. Okay, okay, I get it. Y'all want to see what's in the box? I want to see what's in the box, too. La Dama Dorada is very handy with needle and thread. So I know what's in here, but I have not seen this yet. So this is totally new and exciting to me. All right, it's gone from blue to white. That's a promising sign. It definitely looks and feels like a box. It's a box with a, an inscription, Con todos mi amor, la dama dorada. No. Et tu. We're going to open this thing up, and we are going to see, hmm, a mysterious purple envelope. I wasn't expecting this. What is this? A mysterious purple envelope. Ah, uh, yes. This is a saying that was come up with by La Dama Dorada, and you're going to be seeing this in the background of Tent Talk Tunes. If art decorates space, then music decorates time. She said it. I flipped. That is good. And I like the purple envelope, too. That purple envelope is beautiful. Place that down there. And we have a uh, strange oh there you go the this sort of gives you a clue as to what her profession is career in tech ed is red for ed she's an educator that's a clue and then we see in addition to a spooky scary bat and a cute and cuddly sort of genetically mutated organism. We have... Oh, wait, there's another one. Another one. Another cute and cuddly GMO. Might be a potato, I would like to think it is. Ooh, and a couple of eyeballs. Maybe if I put these on my, uh, my dollar store specs, I'll be able to see even better than I can see now. Oh, and a third one, too. Yes. I have the third eye now. Still got it. <laughs> Finally, after all that bourgeois and fall de raw, we get to the meat of the matter. A very carefully, lovingly, hand-tied piece of soft fabric, which... As we undo, it's been a long time coming. This is, I'm going to stress right now, unique, one-of-a-kind, handmade, nowhere else except on this planet, custom version 
of the Devo Maxi Turtleneck. Now, this, this is not going to do it justice, but I sent her a white shirt, a black shirt, and a red shirt. And she tore them apart and stitched them back together. We were going back and forth on sizes and measurements and panel shapes and collar shapes. I mean, I figured, you know, you just take a couple of shirts and stitch them together and you've got another shirt. But this is a very, very long involved process that she had to go through in order to make this thing to make the proper sleeveless look. I mean, I'm just a rocker. I'm just a dude. I don't know anything about this stuff. She went through a lot of time and effort and trouble to create this custom version of the Devo sleeveless maxi turtleneck. I think it's only right that I put it on. What do you guys think? I mean, just to, to show it like this does not nearly do it justice. I'm going to put it on. Let's check the monitor here. We got some love there. Okay, I'm going to step off camera for one second because, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people would love to see me change my shirt in public, but that's one of those things you got to pay for. If you want to see the private show, you got to pay. So just hang on one second. I'm going to step off camera. Great opportunity for you to study the flyers and stuff on the bulletin board here. And when I come back, I'm going to look completely different. Won't take long. I mean, all I gotta do is whip one off and whip the other one on. And I am very quick when I need to be. It's happening, kids. I got one off, getting the other one on, putting it on carefully. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And I'm sure a lot of people are gonna like this. How about it? Custom made version of the Devo sleeveless maxi turtleneck. Awesome. Dama Dorada, thank you so very much. I cannot wait to wear this on stage. I'm sitting on it and it's pulling it down. I cannot wait to wear this on stage at the devotional while I perform my set of unwanted Devo tunes. We're going to break their legs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pull this down now. Ah. See, look at that. It even looks stylish when you put it down as well. You can wear it up. You can wear it down. This is one of the key measurements that she needed. It's like, how much of a circumference do you put on the turtleneck part? You know, things like that I never, ever would have thought of. So, oh, so wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to try to figure out something to reciprocate somehow, somehow. And by the way, La Dama Dorada did put out the offer that if people out there want a similar garment to contact, contact me and I will pass the information along to her because this is a damn good thing. As Devo would say, that's good. Man, I'm going to be the best looking spud at Devotional with this thing. You better believe it. All right. So that's an extremely fruitful, productive, and fun check of the mail. What do you say we talk tunes? Whew. This whole thing came about, as so many things do, strictly by accident. I was not looking for this to happen. Well, that's actually kind of a lie. I did set the wheels in motion several years ago. This obsession dates back probably five or six years, five or six years or so. I put the word out to my fellow record dealing friends and also people who were collectors and other people who bought collections because that's what I do. I buy and I sell records. I buy record collections. I sell records. If you have a record collection, you should definitely talk to me if you want to get rid of it. So I can buy it off of you and then find homes for all those records with other people. Anyway, <coughs> I put the word out that I was working on a project, an art project, a sound sculpture, if you will, that involved getting as many 
copies of, you guessed it, whipped cream and other delights as I possibly could. I needed as many of these as I could get my, at the time, both functioning mitts on. That looks pretty good though, doesn't it? The brace with the black and the white and the red. I should walk around like this all the time. I really should. I digress. To get as many copies of Whipped Cream and Other Delights as I possibly could. And my fellow record dealers, my fellow record geeks, and my fellow record collectors all rose to the challenge. And before you knew it, I have had, uh, boy, probably about 200 of them. Probably about 200 of these things. <laughs> I was not prepared for the onslaught of whipped creams that I got. I got them in all kinds of conditions. I got them in all kinds of what I'm soon to discover, pressing variants and versions. And that's what I wanted to talk about. This is a record that everybody in the universe knows. Came out, I think, okay, and remember, I'm not a Wikipedia entry here. I'm just a dude who experiences these things as I have experienced them. This record came out, I'm going to guess, 1966, 65, somewhere around there. Maybe even 64, something like that. 63, 64, 65. <coughs> In fact, I'm going to refine my guess even more, okay? Because this record came out on, as you can see, A&M Records. A&M's first ever record release was a 45 RPM single by a really weird, bizarre band from the California desert called Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band. Did you know that? The first A&M record ever was by Captain Beefheart. And that came out in 65. So by the time this came out, according to the back cover, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass had already made a half a dozen albums. So you figure two albums a year, right? Let's, let's just say 68. There was probably not a single household in the United States of America that did not have a copy of this record in it. It's unbelievable how many of these were sold. Incredible numbers. Don't know the exact numbers, but it was a lot. I'm going to venture to say this is per capita. My bet is that this is the single best-selling album of all time. Okay, never mind that maybe, let's say, this sold 5 million and Fleetwood Mac Rumors sold 25 million. What I'm saying is that per capita at the time, when you look at the number of record players that there were in the world and the number of these records that got sold in the world, I would say that the percentage, the ratio of whipped creams to functioning turntables is higher than any other record released in the history of mankind. That's my, that's my postulation. That's my postulation. That's my theorem. Could it be proven or disproven? I don't know. But just going by the sheer numbers of these things, that is my theorem. So you see these things everywhere. Everywhere. You can go to the thrift shop right now and you're going to find a whipped cream. You can go to a record swap meet right now and you're going to find a bunch of whipped creams. You can go to any record store anywhere. And if you look hard enough, you're going to find some whipped creams. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a record that's just like part of the cultural landscape. It's part of the fabric of our being. I mean, it is maybe the greatest album cover of all time. I will also speculate that in an age when sexuality was heavily repressed and pornography was illegal, when even just having a girly magazine was enough to get you thrown out of the house when they had to sell Playboy magazines under the counter to put this boldly in every dime store, drug store, department store, record store in the land. That was pretty bold. 
That was pretty ballsy. If you just put this guy on the front cover, I'll bet you dollars to dog biscuits that it would not have sold nearly as well. If I were of record buying age around that time, <coughs> excuse me, and I were going to buy a record that looked like that, or a record that looked like this, you know I'm going to buy the record that looks like this. Come on, guys. As somebody astutely pointed out in the, the comments section when I announced the, co the topic tonight, somebody said, oh, you mean there were records in that thing? Yes. It's the cover, baby. The cover. I have sold copies of this record to people who wanted it only for the cover. In fact, if you look at the comments on my Facebook page on the announcement, you see my good pal Kate posted a photo of her framed copy of Whipped Cream that was hanging in tandem with her framed copy of Soul Asylum's Takeoff on this album, The Clam Dip and Other Delights. Looks great. In my opinion, that's art. This is art, baby. This is art. I mean, since I started acquiring these things, I ended up studying this cover very carefully. You know, like the position that she's seated in, the way the whipped cream is spread all over her, her facial expression, the little dollop, the sort of flower in her hair, as it were, and the fact that every song on this album is named after some kind of food. It took me a long time to twig to that, but yeah, a taste of honey, green peppers, tangerine, all the way to the last song on side two, right there, which I'm sure a young Axl Rose saw. And he is gonna name, he's going to name his band Lollipops and Roses. I don't doubt that for a second. Lollipops and Roses featuring Axl Rose. But somebody gave him some career advice and said, don't do Lollipops and Roses, do... Guns and Roses. If you're going to get phallic, you've got to be really obvious about it. Just like your music. Your music is very obvious. I'm going to go on a tear right now. Hope you don't mind. About Guns and Roses. Like the name of the band, your music is very obvious. It lacks imagination. It's trite. You know exactly where every song is going to go. And people are so starved for anything that even has the slightest whiff of authenticity that you, Axl Rose, are going to sell 27 billion albums because of your fake, trite, obvious, vanilla brand of rebellious rock and roll. End of rant. I have no doubt that there's one of these in Axl Rose's home when he was a little kid and he saw that title... And he knew, he knew the dull, boring path that his life was going to take. Yep. Anyway, it's iconic. It's ubiquitous. I have probably 200 of them. People buy it just for the cover. What's weird, and this is really weird because there are plenty of other, you know, iconic sorts of albums that sold billions and millions and trillions of copies of. One of them, uh, Fleetwood Mac Rumors, for example. And I've, I've come across plenty of Fleetwood Mac Rumors in my day. And a lot of times when I find Fleetwood Mac Rumors, the records are like in mint condition, totally unplayed. Um, Frampton Comes Alive is another one of those. You just could not escape from Frampton Comes Alive. On the rare occasion that I actually pick up a copy of Frampton Comes Alive and look at it, it's often, it's mint condition. It's like people just kind of bought these records because everybody else was buying them, and they would open them up and say, oh, that's nice, and stick it on the shelf and forget about it. What I found with these whipped creams is that they are usually well played. Like, played to death sometimes. I mean, these things are quite often really beat to hell. This copy here is in really good shape, but it's definitely been played. You can't you can't see it because of the lighting in my camera, but it's got, uh, on the label, it has the telltale spindle marks all over the label, you know, where somebody was trying to place it on the turntable and couldn't find the hole, and they rub it all over the, uh, the spindle from the turntable, all over the label. It leaves marks. 
wonder if you can actually see the spindle marks if I hold it up to light correctly. No, I don't really have the right light to do this on camera. But this is played. It's, it's in pretty good shape, but it's been played. You know, to the extent where the, um, the inner sleeve is missing. Somebody wrote their name on the inside of the cover, if you can see that. This thing got a lot of use, besides just being eye candy. You know, even this copy that's still got the shrink wrap on it. You open it up, and this one's in pretty good shape, but it's got spindle marks all over it. Like, the, the both labels are just covered in spindle marks. I wish that the light would show it. But you can't... You can, you can kind of see it. You can kind of see the spindle marks between the catalog number and the hole there. But you can also see how worn out the hole is. The hole in the record's got all this worn out bits around the uh, the edges of it. You can see the white. That's all wear from being put on and taken off of a turntable. The other side doesn't really have it, so I guess one side of the record is more popular than the other. People play these records. They listen to these things. This one's pretty beat. So it wasn't just a thing that people bought simply for the sake of buying, and they didn't buy it just for the cover. They actually bought it for the music. And that's where it triggers a memory. When I was a little kid, growing up in South Florida, there was a really popular amusement park. It was a theme park called Pirate's World. And Pirate's World was in Dania, Florida. And a fun factoid, uh, my aunt and uncle live in Dania on the property, on the very property where Pirate's World once stood. So my aunt and uncle have a very tangible and very real connection to what was once Pirate's World. Anyway, Pirate's World was like the weekend destination when we were kids. You know, it was like mom and dad, me and my brothers, we would go up to Dania to Pirate's World and, you know, ride the log flume and the steeplechase and the wild mouse and the crazy cat and the fake pirate ship. We were all about that. And Pirate's World had you know, like loudspeakers all throughout the park that played music. And I will remember forever to the day I die, I will have this indelible memory of A Taste of Honey from this album being played over the loudspeakers. I mean, I remember it being on a loop constantly. Uh, it's really the only song I ever remember being played over the loudspeakers of Pirate's World. They might have played others, but it seems like it was always a taste of honey from the Whipped Cream album. I love that song to this day. I really do. <clears throat> what about the music? Well, the music, basically, it's all instrumentals. It's not quite Muzak. It's uh, definitely peppier and livelier than Muzak. But it does make for great background music. It's not, to me, it's not the kind of record you're going to sit around and actually listen to carefully. You know, picking apart the arrangements and analyzing, excuse me, analyzing the performance. It's just something that you put on while you're washing the dishes or sweeping the floor or combing the cat or you know picking lice out of your armpits. You know, whatever it is you do around the house, you just sort of have this on as background music. It sounds nothing like the first ever A&M record, Captain Beefheart. Not a thing. It's peppy, it's lively, it's lightweight, it's fun, and it sold umpteen centrifugillion copies. Lord have mercy. Let's check the monitor and see if anybody's left any comments helping to clarify about when it was released and or how many might have been sold. Let's see if I can find me. I've disappeared from my own monitor. You folks watching this on rerun don't get the thrill that I feel of me trying to find myself on a damn cell phone. Hey, there I am. This only happens live. You can only get this live on 10 Talks Tunes. Boy, people are really, really reacting to whipped cream and other delights. Oh, okay. My pal Vaughn Nunya Damn Business says that Spanish Flea was the theme for the dating game theme television show. Is Spanish Flea on this one? It is not. Spanish Flea is on another one of those half a dozen Herb Alpert records. 
that makes a lot of sense. I watched the dating game a lot when I was a kid. I didn't know what the hell it was all about, but I do kind of remember that song. Pretty cool. And uh, James Pogo makes a comment about how the JFK Memorial album might have sold just as, just as many as Herb Alpert. James Pogo, I'm not going to reveal any surprises, but let's just say that you're on to something there. Keep watching Tent Talks Tunes. So we've got this album that sold just tons and tons and tons, and people actually did listen to it. They actually did play it. And so when you're selling that many records, the record company keeps pressing it. And this is where this is where the record geekery comes in. You might tune into like a channel that specializes in Beatles collectibles or super high fidelity classical record collectibles or let's say uh, you know certain label specialty channels. My friends, I'm willing to bet you this is the first time you've ever seen a label dissection of the different pressing variants on whipped cream and other delights. I do not claim to have every single label variant represented here. In fact, I know I don't. There's got to be more than just a few I came up with. But when I was going through these earlier today, I really only came across three major, pun intended, label variants. This is, of course, on the original sort of tan A&M label. You've got this first one that's got the uh, the title in kind of large, blocky letters on two lines with Herb Alpert's Tijuana Brass underneath, and then the uh, you know the catalog information and the song titles in your standard A and M typeface. You got that one. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you got this variant here, which hopefully you can see the difference. It's bigger, bulkier, blockier. The Herb Alpert Tijuana Brass name is bigger. The catalog number typeface is bigger and bolder. The logo is the same. Um, and if you look closely enough, you'll see that the titles are in a slightly different typeface. So that's, a, that's two different pressing variants on this thing. This one is, this is, I believe, this is my favorite. I believe this is the first pressing, the very first pressing. Because so I've never seen this label variant anywhere with the A&M logo on top and a very small typeface underneath. I have never once in my life ever seen an A&M record with the logo on top like that. And this is, I'm pretty sure, the only copy of Whipped Cream I have with this label variant. So I'm going to guess this is first pressing. And it's kind of the same deal. If anybody out there has any information, please feel free to post it. Um, as I said earlier, I'm not Wikipedia. I'm also not Discogs. I'm just a guy who loves to collect records and spot these uh, variances. I really think that's cool. I mean, the A&M, the old A&M logo label is a classic, but seeing it on top like that it's just one of those little simple differences that we record collectors and freaks and geeks live for. Looks great. Love it. Wonder why they didn't uh, stick with that. Here's another standard stereo copy. Well, actually, that's... Uh... Oh, well, if you really, really want to pay attention, <laughs> this here's one of those variants that you're just totally going to lose your shite over. You can see this one's got the same typeface, but the spacing is different. You can see that, where is it? The title and the band name are closer to the credits, to the catalog number and the side designation. Where am I going with this thing? They're closer and it's a different typeface. That's a different pressing. Oh my god. This is the kind of stuff that keeps me awake at night, man. I don't know about you, but I, I will lose sleep over this. Wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say lose my mind, but I will lose sleep, definitely. I will totally lose sleep over this. And then this, once again, just using guesswork, since the typeface in the front is very similar to the A&M logo on top version that I just showed you, it's the small typeface, 
the small font, but with the A&M logo on the side, as uh, is the classic design. So I'm going to venture a guess and say that that's the second pressing. And then everything else just fell into place after that. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm also going to point out something I really love about this one copy here that's still got the shrink wrap on it. I love the old style department store price tags on it. And the fact that when this came out, the list price on it was $379. But the bin price was $287. So yeah, you could walk into a department store and buy this record new off the rack for $2.87. I'm also a big fan of the tag that you have in the corner. A lot of times department stores would use those as the price tags and they would actually staple them onto the cover, which is why a lot of times you'll find these old pressings from the 60s and they've still either got the staple in the cover or they've got the holes where the staple once was. It took me years to figure out why those staples were in the covers until I found one that had the, the tag stapled on it, and then it made perfect sense. This one is stuck on. Oh my god. I gotta drink some of this Danbury tap to cool down a little bit. I'm getting all excited talking about these whipped cream variants. Now, we've got some interesting cover variants. And this is really weird because, <coughs> excuse, me, this, excuse me, this sort of like, this is a test amount, a test amount, a testimony, a testament. That's the word I'm looking for. A testament to the sheer number of records that this for Schlugener title sold. An interesting, maybe it's a mispress, I don't know. But on these old-fashioned, what they call tip-on record sleeves, it's a sort of a, kind of a thick cardboard with, and I'll show you one of these here, a regular pressing. It's got the cover art printed and then glued to the front and folded over on the back. And then on the back, a, I guess like 11 and 3 quarter by 11 3 quarter sheet of paper that's glued onto the back. If you can see, it covers the seams from where the design was printed on the front and folded over like that. So the front cover, what they call a slick, was glued, <laughs> excuse me, glued on the front, folded over, glued onto the back, and then the back cover art was glued on top of it. So the seam is there underneath the back cover art. Every once in a great while, you'll find one that's reversed. And you can see that they did it in the exact opposite way. They took the back cover, slick, glued it onto what would be the front of the cover, folded it over, and then glued the front cover art to cover the seam. Now, you really don't see inverse printing jobs like that very often. I've seen a couple here and there of other titles. But uh, stand on my skull and call me shorty, I have seen a lot of these whipped creams that are printed like that. Like a lot of them. I probably have probably 15 or 20 of them in this stash. So lots of these printed like that, not only in stereo, but you figure this is going to come up in mono. Yes, whipped cream and other delights is far more common in stereo than mono, but there are still plenty of monos out there, and also plenty of monos that have this weird press, this weird printing variant. Where you can see the stripe on top and on bottom where the slick was glued on, but didn't cover the entire cover. And this has uh, in mono a pretty good example of the large font. And you can tell the uh, monos, <coughs> excuse me, of course, because it doesn't have the stereo designation in the corner. And it's got the catalog number on the bottom. Whereas the stereos have stereo on the top and the catalog number on top. And the entire design of the cover is elevated a little bit. It's amazing that you can get into such detail with this stuff. So much fun. So yes, stereo, mono, inversely printed... 
correctly printed, and God only knows how many different label variations. So just to wrap up, I'm going to show you my three favorite versions of Whipped Cream and Other Delights. Actually four, because my favorite favorite is the one I showed you earlier with the A&M logo on top of the label. That one, I don't know why, that just really, really gets my goat, so to speak. I just think that is so cool. Every A&M record I ever owned when I was a kid, you know, like Joe Cocker, uh, Joe Cocker records, Captain and Tennille, well, not Captain and Tennille, but uh, The Carpenters, right? Joe Cocker, The Carpenters, Tijuana Brass, um, God, whoever else was on A&M at the time, every single one of those labels had the logo on the side. So it just triggers me. It triggers my sense of delight to see one on the top. Some people get a kick out of going to the Grand Canyon and looking over the edge of the Grand Canyon. I get a kick over a misplaced record logo on a label. I also get a big kick out of the fact that whipped cream and other delights, in spite of the fact that it sold gazillions of truckloads of albums in sometime in the 60s, I figured that it was the kind of thing that had sold so many and had so saturated the market that that was it. They never bothered repressing it. That there was no need to. That everybody who was already going to buy a copy had bought a copy. Well, change my name to Ritz and call me a cracker, but if I didn't just find, very recently, a copy of Whipped Cream, and remember what I said earlier about the tip-on covers, with the thick cardboard and the art glued, this, hopefully you can see, is actually thin cardboard. The art is printed directly on a semi-glossy thin jacket, which is the telltale sign of a later pressing. 70s and 80s. And, oh my god, wouldn't you know it? Look at that. This is an actual 70s and or 80s pressing of whipped cream and other delights with the thin style sleeve and the 70s A&M logo. Unbelievable. Anybody who ever owned Frampton Comes Alive knows what that looks like. Anybody who owned uh, records by Squeeze or the Captain and Tennille or uh, name, name somebody, but this was the logo of the 70s, man. This is what you saw on your copy of Frampton Comes Alive and holy shimoli. Whipped Cream and Other Delights with the 70s A&M label. This is the only copy I've ever, ever, ever seen like this. Thin Sleeve, 70s A&M label. Does anybody care about that besides myself? I doubt it very much. Do I care? Yes. Do I care if anybody else cares? No. As Sammy Davis Jr. said, I gotta be me. Now, this is great too. My pal Stefan from the great island of New Zealand posted on my comment section earlier that every household in the world had one. And I think Stefan must have been right because the first time I saw this one, I was intrigued by the fact that it's on the thin very glossy, as you can see. That's not a plastic bag or wrap. That's the actual cover. Very glossy, very thin, and, whoa, completely different back cover art with, oh my god, can this be the UK style Garrett and Lofthouse laminated sleeve? It's a UK pressing, dude. A UK pressing of whipped cream and other delights. So they didn't just sell billions of copies in the U.S. They did sell copies overseas and whatnot. And this is the uh, typical a and typical U.K. style of an A&M logo. It's got the same basic layout as the U.S. But for some reason, U.K. albums, especially from that era, quite often had the titles broken up between the top and the bottom of the label with the name and the artist broken up in a similar fashion. 
in their own interesting copyright disclaimer around the edge of the label. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's like a whole different thermos full of minnows right there, a UK pressing. Stefan, if you're watching right now, could you post something? Do you have your parents' copy of whipped cream? Is it a New Zealand pressing? Are there Scandinavian pressings of this thing? Are there German pressings? I want to know. I want to see proof. The fact that there's a British pressing, it lights my fire. And the last version of Whipped Cream and Other Delights for all you people who just love to collect stuff. This is great. This is also the only one I've ever seen. What is it? No, it's not a box of 7-inch singles. Although A&M did do a lot of new wave marketing like that. This, my friends, is a 7-inch 4-track stereo impossible to open Reel-to-reel tape. Oh, yes. That's an actual made-for-the-consumer market, factory-made, pre-recorded, reel-to-reel tape. And not only that, it runs at 7.5 IPS, which means, and I've, I've yet to put this onto my uh, reel-to-reel player, it probably sounds magnificent. This is probably sonically one of the best things you will ever hear, even if you don't like the music. Just the way that these things are recorded and duplicated, man, they sound incredible, especially at seven and a half inches per second. That's not that's not like recording studio quality, but that's top end home consumer quality. Front, back, different layout on the back, of course. You'll notice that the US and the UK and the tape version all have the exact same liner notes, which is pretty cool. It's also got a really neat variation of A&M logo, white on black. A&M stereo tape. Really, really cool. <clears throat> so that, my friends, basically in a nutshell, and I do mean nut, details one man's morbid obsession with whipped cream and other delights. I hope you guys enjoyed this trawl through a little bit of the story of the record you can't escape from. And my offer to everybody out there still stands. I'm still working on this art project that requires lots of copies of Whipped Cream and Other Delights. If you got some, let me know. The caveat is they got to be cheap or they got to be free because I ain't paying for them. That's the punchline. So if you need somebody be, to be your bulk dumper for whipped cream and other delights, let me know. I don't care about condition. I don't care. As, as you've seen, I don't care about what pressing. I just need stacks of them. So let me know. Message me or leave a comment or something like that. And, um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Had a real good time talking to you today here on Tent Talks Tunes. Me and my sharp Devo Maxi turtleneck. I love this thing. So yeah, I do expect to be back in about 167 hours' time. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>